Open your Bibles this morning to the book of Galatians, chapter number 4. <coughs> Galatians, chapter number 4. We are going to break from our study through the book of Ephesians until January gets here. In fact, it'll probably be the second Sunday in January before we resume our study through the book of Ephesians. We have gotten there through Ephesians 5.18, and so we'll pick back up on that theme then. This Sunday... Next Sunday, the following Sunday, I want to take some time to address our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And while that's always a very fitting subject, of course, for any church service, uh, it is even so much the more appropriate uh, concerning the time of year it is. And so we want to center our focus here in the next few Sundays on that reality uh, that God uh, became man, that God became flesh and dwelt among us, John says, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I love looking at it from an Old Testament standpoint to a New Testament standpoint. In the Old Testament, in Genesis 22, Isaac asked his father Abraham, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And in John chapter number 1, John the Baptist found that very lamb, didn't he? When he saw Christ coming to the Jordan to be baptized, John seeing Him as He was still a great distance off, and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And so we'll center our focus on that Lamb of God here this morning, next Sunday and the Sunday after. But that makes me preaching our Sunday evening service or our Christmas service uh, that night. I told him uh, this uh, this past week, we were talking about that, and I said, look, man, I said, that's the Christmas service. Don't preach on hell that night, amen. And, uh, and, And he said, I wonder where I would have learned to do stuff like that from. And so I don't know who he's talking about, uh, but we're both trying to be a little bit more appropriate uh, these days uh, as, uh, as the Lord allows us to be. Amen. Glad to be here in Galatians chapter 4 this morning. We're going to look at the humanity of Christ. And, um, and we'll lay just a little bit of groundwork before we uh, read our text this morning. But just that, that great feature again, that God became man. And I think a lot of times we kind of skim over that. And really, that that great feature is one of the stumbling blocks of Christianity, that God would condescend to that level. Uh, Probably no greater exposition on that from the Scriptures than in Philippians chapter number 2, where Paul is exhorting believers to let that mind, which was in Christ Jesus, also be a part of their daily activities. Uh, Who, Paul says, talking about Christ, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, yet He made Himself, the Bible says, of no reputation, and um, made Himself, fashioned Himself in the likeness of men, being found in fashion as a man. The Bible says He humbled Himself, and He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So God becomes man for the sole purpose of redeeming man from the lowest state in which we fell when uh, Adam plummeted us all into Sin, and uh, and so this reality of God becoming man is absolutely necessary in the drama of redemption. Uh, you and I simply could not and would not be saved today if God had not become a man in the person of of Jesus Christ. And so again, we'll we'll look at some verses here in just a moment here in Galatians chapter number four. But but we're turning our attention there this morning to to that great reality that uh, that. Um, that, that God became a man. And so uh, really, to, to do that, in order for us to resolve that again in our hearts, that, that God becomes a man, we're, we're talking about the two distinct natures of Jesus Christ. And, and both of them are, are natures that are 100% fulfilled in Jesus. And, and that is, when we're talking about Jesus Christ, we're talking about... God and 100% man. Uh, We're not talking about a a 50-50 mixture here. Uh, But um, although he made himself, again, Philippians 2, of no reputation, uh, yet he didn't divest himself of any of his glory. He, He didn't lay aside any of his divinity inside of his humanity, and yet at the same time, he assumes 100% of humanity as far as being flesh is concerned. And so in the person of Jesus, we have His humanity as well as His divinity. And so 
This morning, we're going to spend our time looking at the humanity of Christ, which is really referenced by that high term, theologically speaking, of the incarnation of Christ. The incarnation. The word incarnation comes to us from the Latin version of John chapter 1 and verse number 14. Brother Josh alluded to that, and we've already alluded to it this morning, that the Word became flesh and dwelled among us. There is that idea of incarnation for us. Yeah, uh, the Word itself refers to a fleshly embodiment of deity, which is exactly what we have in Jesus Christ. 100% deity in 100% flesh. Here's the way Paul said it to the church at Colossae, chapter 2 and verse number 9, for in Him, that is, in Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. All of God in all of flesh, right? In the person of Jesus Christ, in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And this great event, the incarnation of God in the person of Jesus Christ is exactly what Paul alludes to here in Galatians chapter 4. Our attention is going to be focused on verses 4 and verse number 5, but I want to back up and begin in verse number 1 this morning. If you have your Bibles open there, Paul writes, and he says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. There is, um, in what Paul has given to us in these opening five verses of Galatians chapter number 4, uh, this great transition that Paul has made an allusion to, uh, almost a graduation, if you will, that, uh, that, that has taken place where the Father Himself has removed humanity from the strict adherence of the ordinances of the law in some way of obtaining salvation. Uh, God had determined a specific time where there would be this transition of sorts from a law known as the rudiments of this world, a strict adherence to certain rules and regulations, where, where there would be a graduation from that to a redemption that would only be offered in the person of Jesus Christ that would allow us to be received and to experience the adoption of sons. And so in this transition, God has provided for us an absolute and full redemption, again, allowing you and I to be adopted into the family of God. Ephesians chapter number 1, we are accepted in the Beloved. Uh, Peter says that, uh, uh, that we are now translated into the kingdom, the family of God's dear Son. That's a reoccurring theme really for the Apostle Paul through much of the book of Ephesians where, where he, he is highlighting the fact that both Jew and Gentile have been put together inside of that body, that building that is being fitly framed together. And so there is that full redemption that we have being adopted, being received into the very family of God. And Paul says that this was all accomplished by the incarnation, by the fact that God became a man, hence the humanity of Christ. Not, not, not just that all things were made by Him, without Him... Uh, there was nothing made that was made. Of course that's true. Jesus Christ is, is denoted in the New Testament as the Creator of all things. He is very God of very God. In fact, the Bible says not only does He make all things, but that He holds together all things, that by Him all things consist. Uh, that's why when you walk outside uh, uh, here in just a, a, a moment, you don't fly out into space somewhere because God's holding this whole universe 
together. Uh, he's he's uh, he he not only started the earth on a, whatever rotation on an axis that we have to produce a, a certain gravitational pull that wouldn't squash you, but also wouldn't allow you to float off into outer space. He not only started that, but he keeps that gravitational pull going. He he didn't only uh, cause the sun to appear, but he has sustained the sun and sustained the earth at an appropriate distance from the sun again, so as to sustain life. Jesus Christ began life and He sustains life. Or in the words of Job, the Lord gives and eventually the Lord will take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so you have Jesus who is fully God. And yet we have Jesus again who is fully man. And it is it is for the express purpose of redemption that He becomes fully man so that you and I might receive the adoption of sons, the humanity of Christ. Now, let's come into verse number 4 and let's look at it a little bit more carefully this morning. This assuming of flesh and blood, uh, Paul says, inside of verse number 4, took place at the fullness of the time. Do you see that? But, Paul says, when the fullness of the time was come. That's a very important phraseology there for us. Uh, All of this happens, God becomes a man when the fullness of the time had come. And so the question becomes for us, why didn't Christ come sooner? Why didn't God become a man sooner? Uh, The Bible here is saying, Paul is saying to us that all of this happened at, at the right time. But my mind immediately begins asking the question, why couldn't a time earlier to this had been the right time? Why allow, why suffer Humanity, 4,000 years of devolution. Why allow humanity to progressively get worse and worse and worse over a period of 4,000 years before you sin the promise of redemption? Well, uh, what Paul says is that, that that was not the appropriate time according to the counsel of God. There was the fullness of time. The word fullness refers to completion. Uh, again, almost a sense of graduation, if you will. The fullness of the time, the expression refers to a completion of the period of preparation of God's sovereign timetable. What Paul's producing for us is that God is on the throne and that He's calling the shots. And He's calling them so precisely that He has a timetable of events laid out. Now remember that God inhabits eternity. Time is something that you and I experience, but God does not operate in time. Hence, in John 11, He can be four days late and yet still be on time because He is not restricted by time, by decay, or any of those other other features. And so God has laid out beforehand uh, history before it ever unfolds. We call that prophecy, but for God, uh, what hasn't happened yet is as good as it's already happened. Again, Romans chapter 8, those of us that, uh, that have been saved are already considered to be glorified, even though you and I don't necessarily look glorified. Now, if you doubt that, you're welcome to step up behind the pulpit one Sunday morning and uh, see what I see, right? And you're probably seeing the same thing. You should see what we're seeing, preacher. I don't want to go there this morning, all right? Uh, it's a bad morning already, all right? Uh, so we're not glorified, but God considers this already to be so because He's the sovereign ruler of earth and heaven. And so nothing happens outside the counsel and even the express permission of His own will. And so Paul says that there is a timetable and God had on that timetable a particular point mark where Jesus Christ, where God Himself was going to become a man. A specific time for that. and, And everything leading up to that point in time was simply a period of preparation. You say, preacher, where do you get that? Well, that's the argument of Paul in the earlier verses here in chapter number 4. He is dealing uh, with the difference between a child and a servant. All right, He says in verse number 1 that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. But, here's what the child is, he is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. In other words, you have to get up five days a week and go to school, (laughs) right? (laughs) And all the young people said, I'm done with the message, (laughs) right? 
That's what Paul's dealing with. You have to get up and you have to go to your teachers, your tutors, your governors, those that are instructing you. And, and here's the difference between that societal setting and our modern day culture is that they went until the father said, okay, you've had enough. Now it's time to come to work for me. All right. That's, uh, that's how that worked in their society. In our society, uh, the public educational system gets to decide how much education that you need. And so you'll have to go 13 years, including kindergarten, 14 years if your, if your parents really don't like you, and they make you go to preschool, okay? And so you have all of that time, and that's mandatory. You have to go, or at least until you reach the age 16. If those of you that don't know that, you're 16, you just kind of quit and walk away at this point in time, all right? And um, giving out a lot of good information this morning. So it's just a little bit of a, uh, of a different, different structure, all right? And, and, and here's, here's one major difference. In our setting, it doesn't matter if your parents see potential in you or not. You still have to go. In fact, uh, the public school system doesn't even have to see any uh, potential in you. They just, they'll just pass you along, right? Because no child left behind. And you just kind of keep going and going and going. And if you're not smart enough to do the other test, they'll give you a different kind of test and you can just pass. And I'm really getting myself into a mess this morning, all right? And so there has to be no potential. But in this setting, if your father saw that you weren't going to cut it, he'd just drop you out and make you go on the farm. <laughs> and that's what he says, right? Verse number two, until the time appointed of the father. The father sees that you can't add two plus two. No need in sending you back to school. Uh, we'll just pull you out now and show you how to use a hoe and a shovel. And so, and so all of that's happening. It's a time of preparation. And who gets to decide when the time is appointed for you to stop being up underneath that certain section and graduate or transition into a new section. Well, verse number two says it's the time appointed of the Father. And the correlation, verse number three, even so when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of this world. But here's the time appointed of the Father. When the fullness of the time, when that time period of preparation was deemed to be completed by the Father, humanity as far as history is concerned, hit that mark on the timetable where God says, here is where I'm going to send my son. The fullness of the time. We, we might say it like this, the appropriate time. Now, now, now we have the privilege of hindsight. Why was it appropriate? And, and we could offer a, a lot of suppositions. It was, it was appropriate for Christ to come at that point in time because of language. The, the barrier of language had pretty much been broken down because of Alexander the Great and Hellenization and a Greek influence. And so almost a known world all spoke the Greek language. And so you had the ease of communicating the gospel message. You had what's referred to as Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. And so everything was in kind of a docile state. You could travel without a, uh, with very limited restrictions. And so after Jesus dies and is buried and resurrects and His disciples receive power, they're going to be able to travel very freely as persecution hits in this area. They'll just keep marching on and marching on and marching on. And there's a half a dozen of other, other reasons why we can say this is the right time. But really the only source that we need to draw from is the fact that God said it was the right time. And so Jesus Christ literally splits history from B.C. to A.D. and comes at that point where God says, this is the right time for me to send my son. Now, now there's arguments from the world of skepticism. Always in regards to, to the Bible and to Christianity, to the very notion of God. And one of those arguments from the world of skepticism says that we as Christians just always kind of make an escape route for God. So whatever God does, we say, well, God did the right thing. And that's kind of the argument that's always pervading around the world of skepticism. And so in regards to Galatians 4, verse number 4, where we're saying that God sent His Son at just the right time, what denotes it is the right time? It's just the fact that God did it and the cop out of Christianity to say, well, God did it and so it must have been the right time. But that's not always necessarily the case. In fact, I would argue that it's rarely the case. In fact, there is a standard that God has given even to us whereby we can even, we, we can, we can kind of look and see why God is doing the things that He does. And that standard for us today is the Bible. God's Word is going to tell us why God does and is doing and will do the things that He is always participating in. In regards to the coming of Christ, how do we, how do we say that? How, who's, what, what's the standard preacher? Where, where in the Bible can we turn to 
that is going to emphatically declare to us uh, God really did send His Son at just the right time. Well, uh, for starters, what about Daniel chapter number 9? You don't have to turn there this morning. But 500 years before the birth of Christ, okay, Daniel is going to be given a certain revelation from God. And in Daniel chapter 9, beginning in verse number 24, he is going to give to us that specific prophecy of the outlay or the timeline, if you will, of how God is about to operate in futuristic days. And inside of that time schedule, Daniel is going to specifically refer to the coming of Messiah and to Messiah's death. And if you've ever wondered why those uh, wise men, those astrologers from, from Babylonia were so interested in a star that had appeared and they followed it for so long until they came to the place where Jesus Christ had been, uh, uh, had been lame. If you've ever wondered why they were so interested, it's because they had understood Daniel had given to those men, that group of men, 500 years before the event took place, that timeline, and they knew, and it had been passed down from generation to generation to generation, that at this point in time, there is something amazing that's going to happen to this group of people who are going to be living in this particular land. And, uh, and, and at that point in time, you need to be interested in what's going on. And so they were astrologers. They're not kings. As the, uh, as the song says, uh, but they were more or less astrologers and they, 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 they paid attention to the heavens. And so when they saw this particular star, more than likely the Shekinah glory of God, they, they knew there was something. They had never seen that star before and it was a part of any other consolation. And they said, wow, there's something going on at this particular time set that Daniel had given to, to our group of individuals 500 years ago. Let's go follow it because I'm going to, I'm going to think I'm going to think this, that, that that star maybe is going to lead us to the Messiah that Daniel actually told us about. And when that time got here, God delivered on His promise. That's why Paul could say, when the fullness of the time, at just the right time, the incarnation takes place at precisely the time God had appointed. Now, there's another great feature here that Paul addresses as far as the humanity of Christ in, in verse number 4. Uh, he says that when the fullness of time was come, notice the next expression, God sent forth His Son. God sent forth His Son. And here in this one phrase, we have the preexistence of the Savior. That's alluded to. He doesn't bring forth His Son, but He sends forth His Son. Well, we have the eternal Sonship of Jesus Christ here, all right? He doesn't become uh, the Son of God uh, in His incarnation, but He was the eternally begotten Son of God. And, and so again, you have that pre-existence. He doesn't come into being, but He is rather already in being. He is already existing. He is sent, simply sent forth. The uh, phrase sent forth is used of one who is sent in another direction to execute a commission. The rationale is that he, uh, that is, Jesus had already existed, but now he will take on a substantially different form while retaining the same nature. I read where one Bible teacher said that, uh, that, uh, that the second person uh, in the Trinity had always existed, but he had never existed as the Son up until this point. Well, um, such Bible teachers probably need to rethink their calling into the ministry. Even in the book of Proverbs, we have that great question, uh, what is his name in reference to God and what is his son's name, right? And so the idea that God has a son, in fact, uh, David is going to tell us in the book of Psalms that, uh, that, that we are to kiss the son lest he be angry with us. And so, and so God's son has always been in existence. In fact, that's the argument John's going to make. Uh, that, that, uh, that in the beginning was the word, the logos, right? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. This is God. And that, and that word, that logos in verse number 14 becomes flesh. He has always existed, eternally existed with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Yet in, uh, in the incarnation, He just simply assumes a different form while retaining the same nature of being very God of very God. 
And he comes with a different commission. What is the new commission that he has given? Verse number 4 tells us, to be made of a woman. To be made of a woman, to become man. The humanity of Christ. God must become man. Again, John 1.14. What about Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14? And the writer of Hebrews is talking about flesh and blood, and it makes a reference to Christ, and it says that He Himself likewise took part of the same. He becomes flesh and blood. And, and, and notice, I love, the, I love the wording in verse number 4. God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law. He assumes this nature, alright? He, he took part, the writer of Hebrews says. He became it. Because he was not that necessarily originally. Uh, he, he has not always been flesh. And by the way, uh, Jesus Christ will not always be flesh. But we're told that in the consummation of all things, that Christ will surrender himself back up to the Father, that God may be all in all, right? And so, and so we see, we see Jesus Christ as a man for the strict purpose of redemption. He becomes a man to redeem us and he retains his, his humanity even while he is in heaven as our intercessor sustaining our salvation. And he will not cease to be a man until he delivers all things back up to the Father. The, his humiliation. His condensation, His his coming down to us and becoming one of us, being made a little lower than the angels again, was so that you and I might be might receive the adoption of sons. Jesus Christ doesn't just become a man, Paul says again, verse number 4, but He becomes a man who is placed up underneath the law. Right? Up underneath the law. I, I thought that was interesting that the one lawgiver now becomes a man who is subject to the very law that he gave, right? And he has to live, adhere to it in a strict sense. He must fulfill the law. He couldn't break it. In fact, Jesus said, not one jot nor one tittle would, would, would be erased, removed from the law until all things were fulfilled. Fulfilled by whom? Well, fulfilled by Him. He's the only one that could, could fulfill it. But the Bible says, therefore by the deeds of law there shall no flesh be justified. You know there's 613 precepts of the Old Testament law and you and I probably couldn't keep one of them perfectly. Right? We can't even keep one of them perfectly. And, and yet He kept them all perfectly. He, he did no sin. He knew no sin. There was no, no blemish, no spot, no nothing wrong in anything. Pilate's examination of Him was emphatically correct. Pilate said, I find no fault in him. And the reason why Pilate couldn't find it is because there was none to be found. It's absolutely perfect in exactly what he came to do. So he becomes subject to the law. Subject in a way that he rendered perfect obedience to that law, performing on our behalf. There's our substitution. He doesn't just die in our place. First of all, he lived in our place. Suffer it, he says to John the Baptist, uh, to fulfill all righteousness. He, he came to do his Father's will. That included the way he lived. That included being circumcised the eighth day. That included that his mother Mary had to pay the price of redemption for her firstborn son, even though he didn't need to be redeemed. Uh, listen, he was brought up according to the strict letter of the law. Even though he knew every hypocrite inside of the temple, he still went there to worship. Isn't that amazing? I mean, he lived by every letter of the law, fulfilling the law, every jot and every tittle of it, a perfect obedience to the law. And so but God becomes a man and lives, dwells among us. Really, as you read through the gospel narratives, you see uh, so many expressions of his humanity. And I think those sometimes for us are overshadowed by, by the expression of His deity. We're so enthralled by that. I'm not at all hinting out that, that we shouldn't. We're going to look at that deity of Christ next Sunday morning. Uh, but, but a lot of times we see, you know, He raises Lazarus from the dead, but we fail to remember that He wept also at the tomb of Lazarus. So many expressions in, in, uh, in Luke chapter 2, we're told that, that Jesus increases in wisdom and in physical maturity. In Mark chapter 4, verse number 38, uh, we're, we're, we're told that Jesus shows exhaustion as He sleeps in the hinder part of the ship. Again, John 11, verse 30, 35, He shows sorrow in John chapter number 2 at the outset of His ministry as well as the conclusion of His ministry. In Matthew chapter number 21, we're, we're, we're told that Jesus shows frustration as He goes in and He drives out the, the money changers in the temple and He declares, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. In John chapter 19, verse 30, uh, verse 28, we're told that he becomes thirsty. So many expressions of his 
humanity. And then there's the means of His humanity. God became a man through a virgin's conception and birth in order to retain His divinity simultaneously. Right? Uh, he, he doesn't just, pff, He's here, but, but he, comes through the, he comes through the means of a woman. Of a woman who was highly favored, highly graced by God. Not Mary the Immaculate, Mary the Sinner who has given favor, given, given grace in her life. And Mary even, uh, uh, even says that she's unworthy. She knows she's unworthy. She couldn't believe that the Lord had looked on a handmaid like her, and yet God did. And the whole story of redemption is one story of grace, isn't it? And so God becomes man through the human instrumentality of a virgin's conception and a virgin's birth, which will allow, we'll see again next week, this, uh, this allowance of Him retaining His divine nature. Again, uh, Mary, if you will, answers the question of how this humanity of Christ is accomplished in this incarnation. But there's so much more important than the question how it's accomplished. Again, the major question that I wanted to come and answer this morning for us is the why. And we've done that already repetitively. Why did God become a man? Why? Why, why all the hype? Why, why the, the Christmas story? Why, why the gospel narrative? Why, why the, why the shepherds worshiping him? Why the attendance of angels? Why, why the wise men? Why, why all the fuss? Why, why is Herod so interested in killing this, this little baby? Why, why all of this? Why God would you become a man? Why choose to do this? Why would this be necessary? And that's given to us by Paul's answer in verse number five to redeem them that were under the law, Amen. that we might receive the adoption of sons. Listen, uh, any person, not just, not just in, a, in a street Jewish setting, any person that attempts to make it to heaven by your own good works, by whatever religious deeds you could do, you have willingly subjected yourself to living up underneath God's law. And, and here's what the Bible says. When that law falls on you, it will grind you to powder. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in His sight. Here's, here's what sin is. Sin is transgression of the law. Right? And you wouldn't have to go very far into the Decalogue, into the Ten Commandments before you figured out that you're a sinner. Right? I mean, let's just take the first of the ten. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And a god is anything that you pledge your allegiance to. Whatever you give the place of preeminence to in your life. Have you always put God first place? Every second of every day has God had His rightful place as, as Lord, as sovereign? None of us. In fact, if you would say that He has then you would not only be in violation of the first commandment, but you'd be in violation of the commandment that says, Thou shalt not bear false witness. Because the Bible says there's none that seeketh after God. <laughs> so none of us of our own accord have ever sought God the way that we should. And so we've subjected ourselves, though, however, up underneath this law. A, a law not written on tables, but a law that's written on our hearts. A conscience. A conscience. The, the word conscience, con means with. Science means knowledge. And so every time you've ever done anything that, that, that you knew you shouldn't have done it, you knew before you did it that you shouldn't have done it. Because God has taken the time to write His law on every man's heart. Amen. And so, and so you've known every time you've ever told a lie, I shouldn't have done that, but I did it. And maybe you got away with it, or so you thought. And so you maybe had to tell another lie to cover that up. Every time you've taken anything, irregardless of its value, every time you've done that, you knew what you were doing was wrong. And somewhere inside of there, your conscience smote you. And you said, man, I shouldn't have done that. Every time you've ever taken the name of God in vain, you knew that you were doing injustice and, and disrespect to the very God that gave you your life. You see, we've subjected ourselves to that, that, that law, covetousness, lying, adultery, lustful thoughts, all of those things. We've, we've, we've violated God's law. And yet the Bible says that God becomes a man because He knew we were sinners. And He came to redeem us who were under that law that we might receive the adoption of sons. That's exactly why He came. Uh, Thomas Watson, one of the greatest of Puritan preachers, uh, wrote down in uh, probably his most famous work, The uh, Body of Divinity, page 192 if you have the book and you want to look at it later on. Um, it's, it's a great, great work. Um, he, he goes through so many doctrines of God. In fact, I, I believe it is the, the book of the month for us uh, this, this, this month in our, in our bookstore. Tremendous work. 
And, and so he, he simply asks questions and then he, and then he answers them. And so in, in that fashion, in regards to the incarnation of Christ, here's one of the questions and the answers Thomas Watson gives to us. He says, was there no other way for the restoring of fallen man, but that God should take flesh? Here's his answer. We must not ask a reason of God's will. It is dangerous to pry into God's ark. We are not to dispute, but to adore. The wise God saw it to be the best way for our redemption that Christ should be incarnate. It was not fit for any to satisfy God's justice but man. And none could do it but God. Therefore, Christ being both God and man is the only fittest to undertake this work of redemption. God becoming man is the only way that you and I can be saved. This isn't just uh, to produce a fanciful story. This isn't, this isn't just uh, to come up with something that we can talk about you know, for around a month every year. This is the only hope that you and I have. It's, it's in this act of redemption that, that, that you and I get, get a, a really a, a, an up-close view of what's known as the law of kinsman redeemer. You remember that from the Old Testament? And the book of Ruth with Boaz, that, that kinsman redeemer, that, that, that law said in order for someone to redeem you from a fallen state, whether that was just a financial hardship or whatever, whatever hardship had come to you, for me to be able to pay the money to redeem you out of that terrible situation, I had to have a certain relationship to you. And so you have the law of kinsman redeemer. In order to redeem, you must have a close relation. And so we have God becoming man. Because he has to have a certain relationship to us if he is to redeem us. Listen, I want to, I want to read to you uh, just, just that, a, a lengthy portion of Scripture, Hebrews chapter number 2. If you want to follow along this morning, Hebrews chapter number 2 is a great place to go to for this humanity of Christ looking at the incarnation of God. And we could read the whole chapter, but just for sake of time, we're going to begin inside of verse number 9, Hebrews chapter 2. And verse number 9, here's what the writer says. He says, But we see Jesus who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. In other words, Jesus becomes a man so that He can die because as God, merely God, He cannot. But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that He, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became Him for whom are all things and by whom are all things, again, His divinity, in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they that are sanctified are all of one, for the which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So the very one in whom are all things and by whom are all things becomes associated with us. And he becomes one with us. Verse number 12, say, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church while I sing praises unto thee. Praise unto thee. Verse 13, and again, I will put my trust in Him, and again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. There's the association of Jesus Christ with fallen humanity. Verse number 14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, He also Himself likewise took part of the same, that through death He might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. How did He do that? Verse number 16, for verily He took not on Him the nature of angels, but He took on Him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things, it behooved Him to be made like unto His brethren, that He might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the, for the sins of the people. For in that He Himself had suffered being tempted, He is able to succor them that are tempted. Jesus Christ, God, becomes a man so He can redeem us. Specifically, so he can die for us. You know, you know, one of the, um, one of the question marks that the, um, that the Muslim community has on, um, on Christianity, on, on the Bible, on the gospel. It, it's not, it's not that we necessarily assert Jesus as God. They have a problem with that. But, but it's not just that we assert Jesus as God, but they can't fathom that if Jesus is God, that he dies. And yet this is the wonder of the gospel. And it's made plain to us that this is the only way that we could be redeemed because God requires a perfect righteousness. 
And therefore, no man can ever offer himself on our behalf because no man has a perfect righteousness. Even those Old Testament priests, when they stood to offer their sacrifices, they had to first sacrifice for themselves to make themselves worthy enough to be able to sacrifice on the, on the behalf of others. But this man, the Bible says, when he had offered one sacrifice for sins, sat down on the right hand of God forever, forever, because the work's done. Here's what Jesus said as He's dying on the cross. It is finished. No more blood. No more sacrifices. No more day of atonement. No more priesthood. I have done it all, Jesus says. Here's how Paul says it. Romans chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh... God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled not by us but in us because He now resides on the inside of us. And so when God sees me as a believer, He does not see my own sin. He sees the righteousness of His Son in my place. Blessed be God for His unspeakable gift of salvation. You and I have a home eternally in the heavens, not because we're some good person, not because there's some intrinsic innate goodness in us, but because Jesus paid it all. And all to Him we owe. Now, listen, There's a, before we close this morning, there's a real danger here. There's a real danger of over-sentimentalizing this humiliation of Christ. This notion that, that God loves and God, God gives. Now, I don't want to ever take anything away from the love of God and the gift that God has given to us in His Son. But it's not just that God loved to save, but it's that He was determined to save. He's not fueled by some Hollywood version of an emotion called love that's better fitted by the word lust. Okay, He's not just solely driven just of that, but He is determined to save. He doesn't just love to save, He was determined to save. It's, uh, again, that's, that's what the humanity of Christ teaches us, that God was determined to save us, that there was no extreme, there was no depth that Jesus would not be willing to plunge Himself into in order to redeem us, to save us from our sins. No depth. In fact, Philippians chapter 2, verse number 7, he would become a slave. A doulos, a slave. The scum, all scouring of the world. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 3, tells us that he would endure endless antagonizations. He can, uh, the Bible says, consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners. Over and over and over again. The Bible says he came into his own. He had his own received him not, right? He, he lives, he does all kinds of miracles. He, he heals sick people. He raises people from the dead. He restores sight to the blind. He makes paralyzed people get up and walk again. He makes uh, dumb people talk and deaf people hear. And He does all of these amazing things. And over and over and over and over again, they say, we don't want anything to do with you. If you're not going to feed us again, we'll go somewhere else. If we're not going to get out of you, if you're not going to lead a military revolt, we're done. I'd soon sell you for the price of a slave, Judah says as to follow you any further. So much so that his own people would cry, crucify him. Crucify him. And here's what the Bible says. He put up with it. He endured all of that. Why? Because he's determined to save you and nothing would stop him. Absolutely nothing. Hebrews 12, verse number 2, he suffered and he died on a cross for the simple joy of saving us. That's it. For that joy... For that privilege that, that he considered, uh, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God. That's determination to say, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Jesus says, I'm, I'm the man. I'll do it. If that's what needs to be done, I'll go to the cross and I'll die in their place. You and I are saved this morning because the incomprehensible God became comprehensible for a moment in time. The infinite God of all glory is seen in finite terms, is wrapped in swaddling clothes, and is laid to rest in a manger. Because God says, I will not suffer them to die and go to hell. The one who inhabits eternity was pleased to tabernacle in time to save everyone who would believe. What an amazing, amazing Savior you and I have.
God becomes a man to redeem them who are under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. The large question at hand this morning is, have you received that adoption? Have you ever came to a place in your life where you saw your own sinfulness and you saw the reason that God became a man and suffered and died on the cross was not to give you a prosperous lifestyle, huh? but was to pay the penalty of your sin and that He was buried and He rose again the third day. And now in repentance and faith you come to Him and you trust Him for your eternal salvation. If you've never done that, you've never been received into the family of God. And I want to plead with you this morning that you don't turn Him away today. Come to Him and trust Him with your soul. Here's the promise of Scripture. Jesus says, all that come to me, I will receive, and I will not cast any one away. That's a precious promise in the Word of God. Let's stand this morning for prayer.